So we are excited today to welcome Professor Markus Reichstein, who has been the director of the Department of Biogeochemical Integration at the Max Planck Institute of Biogeochemistry in Jena since 2012, and a professor of global geoecology at the Friedrich Schiller University Jena since 2014. He studied landscape ecology at the University of Münster before obtaining his PhD from the University of Beirut in 2001. And he then went on to be a Marie Curie Research Fellow at the University of Tuskia in Italy, with research stays at the University of Montana and at the University of California, Berkeley. And before his current positions, he was a research group leader at the Max Planck Institute of Biogeochemistry, Jena, from 2006 to 2012. Professor Reichstein's uh, interests include data-driven earth system science, the application of artificial intelligence and machine learning, global biogeochemical cycles, soils in the earth system, and climate extremes and system resilience. Last year, uh, he was awarded the Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz Prize after being awarded the ERC Synergy Grant USMAL in 2019, winning uh, the 2018 award from the Pierce Sellers Mitkiri, um, sorry, the Sellers Mitkiri Award from the uh, American Geophysical Union, and receiving the Max Planck Research Award of the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation and Max Planck Society in 2013. Uh, today, he will be discussing machine learning model data integration for better understanding of the Earth system. And with that, uh, thank you, Professor Reichstein, for coming today, and I'll uh, let you take it away. Yes, thanks a lot for, his, uh, uh, for the invitation and, and the introduction. Um, looking forward to the to the interactions and the and the discussion. Um, yes, yeah, so I will give a relatively broad picture, probably about um, our view on that on the topic, with of course a, a strong bias towards uh, land uh, ecosystems and the interactions uh, between land ecosystems and uh, and climate. So I hope you uh, will find that interesting. Um, I will try to speed up at the beginning very, very much because I think I'm preaching to the Pope here at the beginning. Um, so the Earth system, no question, you, uh, you know that it's uh, a very challenging and interesting object, very complex. Maybe it's also very important to not read it that it is unique, it, it is a unique system. Uh, so one can do multiple experiments with the whole Earth, but rather have to rely a lot on on observations, so which influences the science quite a bit. And then you see on the on the right hand side. Again, you know that uh, 17 orders of magnitude are spanned basically over the globe. So, uh, also a system of hierarchically spatial, uh, spatial um, organized uh, units. Um, this leads also to this very uh, clear um, textbook concept of spheres in the Earth system. Uh, I will basically just show we have uh, atmosphere, biosphere, um, the cryosphere uh, and the hydrosphere with, with the oceans. I think you are very concerned about this one. And then the, the humans play an important role in the Earth system and these components interact with each other. This is really still um, textbook knowledge and for warming up. And actually from your community, there is also this very nice uh, diagram, the Bretherton diagram, uh, which basically shows that one has been embracing this system view um, where one um, dissect the system into subcomponents that interact with each other. We have here the physical climate system and the, um, uh, the biogeochemical cycles. A little bit change pointer. Um, and without going into detail, you know, uh, the idea is basically from this, one can call it reductionistic approach that we model the different um, processes and subsystems from, from source principles or from observation, semi-empirical equations, then bring that all together, wire that all together, and then uh, hope um, that the whole system, uh, the model system will um, be similar, to the, uh, similar to, the, to, the, to the real system, that the emergent behavior comes out of these interactions uh, within the uh, numerical model. And that has been a very uh, successful uh, paradigm that leads to Earth system modeling overall to uh, climate um, predictions, actually the awareness of how uh, climate will change uh, globally and regionally, no question. Um, but on the other hand, there have been also a, a little bit of a uh, uh, problem, basically, or a scientific puzzle. And I see that from the, uh, 
on the carbon cycle very strongly, but you can have similar, of course, um, findings. You have similar findings from from cloud feedbacks, for example, or also from what's going on in the ocean. And in the land, we basically have the a situation that if we run a coupled uh, system with a, a, a carbon cycle being able to react to climate variability and and trends, um, that while models agree kind of that um, today there is an uptake by land usually uh, roughly um, one uh, one quarter of the hours of CO2 emissions is currently taken up by land um, but the models really disagree into the future some say the uptake will be even stronger in the future so contributing more and more to a negative uh, feedback while other models actually say that this may turn around in the coming decades which would then actually uh, mean a uh, um, a positive feedback so that even additional CO2 is put into the atmosphere um, and thus that, that, that enhance, uh, enhance uh, the greenhouse effect. So this is scientifically, of course, very uh, uncomfortable that we have, we don't even know the sign uh, of, um, of the annual land atmosphere flux of, of carbon dioxide. And a couple of processes may play a role here. I don't go into detail because this is a data science seminar but anyway um this one can actually say this has led to some crisis in, in, in earth system modeling because actually this 2014 paper existed already 2006 so there was a decade of research without much progress in the reduction of those uncertainties regarding the feedback and actually this situation has uh 2017 18 and was published in 19 uh, let us think about um what can we do to improve the situation? And there we basically think um, that indeed the uh, opportunities for data driven earth system science are, are very strong, but they need to be integrated uh, with, with process understanding to be and to be successful in one sentence. And uh, the, the notion is uh, again <clears throat> very, uh, very simple. And this has been also, I think this is also uh, actually a message to uh, machine learning people that actually. Earth system data is actually prototypical for, for big data and, and, uh, and incorporate a lot of interesting challenges for computer scientists and, 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 and machine learners. The four V's here uh, for big data um, are shown and I, I shorten that also up a bit, but one thing that I would um, like to make the point here is actually that's maybe even unique for, for Earth system data is this huge variety of different um, data sources. Uh, some are just one dimensional time series at individual points. Then we have from remote sensing dense fields uh, over the earth at, at varying resolutions. Other data just give a snapshot in space and time if, if it's campaign based or watershed integrating data. So there's really a huge variety of data um, that needs to be um, integrated. And I want to show my first example that this is not uh, not only a curse, or it's actually not a curse, but it's actually an opportunity to uh, exploit the information in different data streams. And that is a um, example that uh, is actually from my own history, if you want, and where I really got into machine learning about 15 years ago or so. Um, the question is basically, how, how do we learn about uh, ecosystem atmosphere um, exchange from ecosystem to global scale? Uh, some of you may, might have heard about um, uh, a method, a micrometallurgical method that is non-destructive um, to measure the exchange of carbon dioxide and water vapor flux and uh, sensible heat flux between ecosystems or land surface and, and the atmosphere. That's the eddy covariance method. Um, it has been a very successful method because it's, it's really non-destructive and covers quite a large area up to a square kilometer. So you see here it's distributed uh, as flux net uh, network uh, across uh, across the globe. Of course, not uniformly distributed, but with a strong uh, density, high density in the U.S. and and in Europe. And this uh, basically measures really uh, these fluxes at half hourly time scale, so we can actually have a get uh, these fingerprints at ecosystem um, scale. Um, this is here now, um, sorry for the small fonts, but it's time of the day on the X axis and time of the year on the, on the Y axis. So it's kind of the isoplease diagram. And we 
see basically each ecosystem actually has a very characteristic um, development of those fluxes over over the year and over the day. Um, here, for example, the tropical rainforest is active all year long. So this is a carbon uptake. So negative numbers. So the blue colors are carbon uptake, and the red numbers are carbon release by respiration. Um, so all, all year long activity. If you go into the European beech forest, um, there's little activity until the leaves uh, go out end of April, so in, in, the, in the coming weeks, and then it rapidly um, develops. And you see that the maximum fluxes here in, in July actually are, are the same uh, as in the tropical rainforest, but the, the season is just uh, much shorter because then we end up in, in November with leaf fall and uh, into the dormant winter period with zero fluxes again. And the uh, contrast uh, uh, Mediterranean forests, we see other drivers that are important. Here we have the maximum fluxes in, in May. It's in spring, it's already warm, but there's still enough water. And then uh, the systems are limited by, by, by water in, in August and September. Uh, and, but then in winter, actually, if there's rain again and it's not too cold, uh, the systems uh, can actually um, still take up carbon, uh, carbon dioxide. So this is just to show the richness basically of, of the data. And you imagine we have basically uh, 2,000 years, uh, 2,000 of those fingerprints from, from around uh, 500 sites um, overall. Um, but still, of course, it is only if you think about how much area of the, of the globe is covered, it's just roughly 500 square kilometers if you want. So it's really acupuncture compared to the 135 million square kilometers that the land surface is on, on Earth. So one cannot just directly uh, extrapolate it um, to the globe or interpolate it uh, to, the, um, to the globe. Instead, um, the idea is really to have a little bit more um, intelligent, maybe um, upscaling, which is still actually very simple. But the idea is basically, OK, we have here these flux observations that go from minute time scale um, to decade time scale. Now we have um, 30 years of data. Um, and at low, uh, at the, at the, from the spatial scale, it's a hectare to a square kilometer scale, but still, uh, certainly not at, not at the global um, scale. And to combine this with, uh, with remote sensing observation, uh, here modus, um, where we have this global coverage every, uh, more or less, um, every day or with high quality or as a composite every, every eight days, for example. And the idea is to bring the information content of those data streams together. The remote sensing data just gives us uh, reflectances, so electromagnetic uh, information, not directly the fluxes, but they can be related um, to the fluxes and to the uh, activity in the ecosystem with machine learning by basically building a model uh, that maps these remote sensing information and meteorological ob observation so uh, these, um, for example, photosynthesis of the ecosystem or evapotranspiration of the ecosystem, so the fluxes of carbon um, and water, and one can use different machine learning uh, approaches here, and then one can apply it globally using using these grid data, and one gets gets a global picture. So that was, if you want, yeah, it was kind of ten, uh, ten years ago, but these um, we are still exploiting these uh, these products, um, and well, at this this way one. I think these were possibly the first uh, data-driven views without any theory, without any assumptions uh, on um, on dynamic biosphere atmosphere exchange. And what, what we get here just from, from these uh, machine learning approaches, for example, here, the photosynthesis, we get, of course, the um, activity in summer um, and inactivity in winter in our um, latitudes. But we get also here quite some uh, monsoonal uh, 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 oscillations, and and also in the in the, in the tropics uh, we see qu uh, quite some change, and of course um, the activity moves uh, with availability of water. But even in the evergreen uh, rainforest, there's still um, quite some variability, and this co varies with evapotranspiration, and often anti varies with the sense of the heat flux, and is of course also related to soil water availability. Um, in terms of modeling, uh, of course, this is not, not only just to, to make these animations, uh, but, but actually it can be then used and has been used um, to constrain these uh, process-driven 
health system models. And we do have also some uncertainty here in gray. It's our product uh, with the uncertainties. Um, but if you look at the ensemble of process models um, at that time, uh, there was actually a huge range, for example, in the tropics. And uh, often outside the range of our product. And this has then led to revise the models, uh, build new hypotheses. For example, regarding the uh, the, the, land, uh, the radiative transfer related to nitrogen effects um, on photosynthesis in the different um, climate zones, and has actually led to a strong improvement uh, in in the models while still being consistent with theory. And uh, just another um, example, what one can also get from that, uh, it's something well that I rather use it in public talks, but. Um, I think it's it's neat to see that just from the data we can actually see what is the conversion efficiency of those ecosystems. Um, basically, plotting the chemical energy that we get from the photosynthesis versus the radiation energy um, that is measured at the sites as well. And and we there's we see that there is a limit here, uh, uh, which is very close. It's actually nice to see this is close to the theoretical. Uh, limit and we also see here uh, the colors actually code the annual precipitation. Uh, we see actually that this limit is only uh, possible when the pre precipitation is also high enough. And the water limited systems here with the, the blue colors, this is not uh, really the case. Um, and if you contrast that, that for example, with photovoltaics, um, for me, it's really or along this figure is an argument that bioenergy is probably not the best way to, um, to solve the energy, uh, the global uh, energy problem. But that's not that's just a side uh, side remark. The second example, um, this was kind of a regression approach, if you want, uh, for 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 getting these uh, photosynthesis and evapotranspiration globally. The second one is more of an unsupervised uh, approach, and that's about a multivariate um, evidences for uh, and detection for anomalies. And here we can actually exploit these the read the multivariate. Um, the dimension of, of the different uh, Earth observations um, that we have um, because these data tubes in space um, and time. Um, and here, of course, the question is, uh, can we identify from the multitude of these data streams uh, situations that are multivariate and in a multivariate sense abnormal and indicate some, uh, some, some behavior, just, again, just from the data, just in a, in a data driven way. And uh, here is basically shown just uh, uh, for Europe and and and, uh, and Russia, the year two thousand ten, where we have basically identified space time situations where these multivariate data streams have been kind of anomal uh, anomalous. Um, and here is here uh, the, the big blob. Um, this one would have also seen in a, in a, in a univariate way. Certainly, it uh, has been also published, of course, that that's a Russian heat wave. But the thing is, we just get that um, from the data um, alone, and we see also the constellation of variables um, that have basically led um, to the to the seed wave. And if you do that globally, um, uh, and look also at the impact um, here on, on productivity, uh, so for example, here this red area is actually the the, the Russian heat wave. Um, we see a negative effect on on photosynthesis on primary production. We see that also for other um, extreme events, hydrometeorological extreme events. But we see also a lot of blue points through this objective analysis, just looking at the data, looking where do we have hydrometeorological extremes, and um, what is the reaction of in this case the uh, photosynthesis. So we have red and blue, and uh, one can now think, okay, what what determines how the how the impact is? And if one just does it with a kind of uh, a scatter plot, where we have here the temperature and and the moisture uh, on the y and x x axis, and then just plot what is the um, anomaly in uh, in photosynthesis of of productivity. Um, so the red again negative. We see well, yeah, there's maybe some more red when it's moist. And when the temperatures are higher, but there are also counter examples. So the picture is not so easy um, uh, differentiable by, uh, by eye. And that's actually where then machine learning, uh, the kind of second level of machine learning can come into play in, for interpreting those results, um, uh, where we would basically say, okay, what are the predictors that 
make either the system react positively or negative to a, a high metallurgical um, extreme. And that's, and that's what we uh, <clears throat> get here, just as one figure um, from uh, Flach, uh, Milan Flach, uh, in a recent paper, Hydro Sciences. And what we actually see that actually land cover, so what kind of vegetation is there plays an important role if um, on, on, on whether the response is positive um, or, or negative to extreme. So forests often benefit actually from 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 extreme events, at least in the short term, which was quite um, surprising. While grasslands and savannas actually have a more uh, negative response. And other people have also found that with with respect to SIF, uh, for example, sun induced fluorescence. So it is it is an interesting uh, and actually still still a puzzle why that really is. But we see also some. A really plausible uh, results, for example, in the increase with increasing growing season temperature, drought will be more and more detrimental. If soil moisture has been already high, um, the effect of soil moisture can be actually positive because then it's maybe not anymore too dry. And what is also interesting and pops up again and again is that the duration of such an extreme event, or so if you want a dose, um, is is quite important. The longer the duration, uh, the more negative um, the response is. These were relatively classical machine learning approaches, and the limitation to all these approaches were actually the dynamic effects were only considered with some hand designed features like cumulative presentation sums uh, or related indices over the last uh, months. Um, and also, spatial context was really not considered, for example, in this regression approach um, where we had just a pixel by pixel prediction, um, uh, while pixels might be also influenced by. Um, neighboring pixels in the atmosphere and the ocean, it's clear because we have these uh, fluid dynamics and, and transport, but also on land that can play a role if you think about landscapes. Um, so, and for these kind of limitations that are very often on, at, at least in, yeah, in, in, in machine learning ha have been quite, quite typical for machine learning, let's say in the, in the 90s and early 2000s, um, is that deep learning really can play an important role where, because deep learning by nature, um, convolutions uh, it, uh, um, are, are, are designed to, uh, to uh, describe, to be able to handle spatial and temporal context. And in the paper, again, actually more for machine learners, wanted to show basically that classical machine learning examples uh, have, have a direct application in the Earth's um, Earth field, like object classification, which is similar to hurricane or atmospheric river. Um, detection, super resolution that relates to statistical downscaling of, of climate data, then more in the time domain, the dynamic domain, video prediction, which is a very hot topic in, uh, in machine learning, relates directly to short term forecasting and, and language translation, where temporal context and history of what has been said plays an important role, what the meaning of the current word means, directly relates to dynamic time series uh, modeling, where if I talk, for example, an ecosystem, how an ecosystem behaves today depends, for example, if the forest was clear cut 10 years ago or not. So, or not. so we also have these kind of legacy effects and, uh, and dynamic uh, lag effects, how we call that. One, one example that I found really neat uh, because it bridges, scales, and goes also from climate to impact uh, is a work uh, by Chris Rekina. In our, in, in our group, uh, where we actually try to predict whole landscapes as seen from space, using predictors um, which are on the, on the like multiple kilometer scale, like mean temperature and uh, annual precipitation that you get from climatological information, but also some information about the digital uh, elevation model. And the question is whether from those predictors can be conditional on that predict actually the landscape, how the landscape looks like, not just the mean and DVI or something, but really the spatial arrangement of the landscape. Um, and I won't go into, into detail here. Uh, um, the method that has been used here is a conditional generative adversarial network, where which basically translates one image or several other images in, into one uh, new image has been um, uh, first, first developed by, by Philip Eastlight at uh, UC Berkeley in 2016. Uh, well, and this is just the idea, and, and this is actually the result um, um, that, that we actually get. So probably you cannot tell uh, what is the real landscape. Uh, it's just a 
sample from the test data set, a good sample, I must admit. Um, and, and what is the, what is the generated, the, the fake um, data? Uh, I don't remember myself at the moment. Um, so, okay, the upper one is actually the predicted one and the lower one is, is the observed one and the predicted, and it's really in the test case, so it's independent of the observed. This is of course just visual and these are also a bit cherry picked, but um, it shows uh, the, the potential. And if you look now into more objective analysis and see if this method <clears throat> can actually extract the the features or predict the features of, of the landscape like let's take for example the fractal dimension um of the landscape given given the climate um, conditions and we just use a normal vanilla neural network you see it the correlation with the target is very low but if we um, use this generative adversary network which includes convolutions uh, in, in particular and for those who are interested it uses a unit architecture uh, there we actually uh, do get um, much much closer um, in terms of correlation to the to the properties of the system and if you go for other uh, metric landscape metrics it's actually going up to almost 0 0.8 in terms of uh, correlation so that was quite uh, quite neat but of course understanding and physical consistency is, is not given uh, at all here and um, that's I think the, one of the key uh challenges uh, now um we know something about physical processes also in landscapes um so do we want to really throw away all all the knowledge um probably not and i think it's also not needed and and one way uh, there are a lot of other studies that actually show that one can also learn something from uh from machine learning and deep learning approaches i have here one example more on the dynamic uh, side um, for you, it probably it's also very clear what are dynamic memory effects. These are time varying properties which depend on the past and possibly on latent variables that we cannot observe. Um, and they are usually described as differential equations or time discrete analog equations and examples in the ecosystem. So for example, vegetation development that depends not on the current instantaneous temperature, but on the cumulative temperature sums, for example, over, over winter and spring. Or the simple thing is also water balance uh, model, where the soil moisture at a certain place, of course, depends on the integral of the influxes and uh, and the outfluxes in that in that soil box. The latter one is too ecophysiological, maybe. Um, and yeah, and the recurrent neural networks um, are actually a ideal method to um, to address these kind of dynamic uh, questions because uh, they do have um, a memory because they ha also have a hidden state like uh, any dynamic model uh, would have. And so the dynamic state develops uh, based on some input variable X and it develops depending on the, also on the past state. So it's a simple actually state space model. And the thing is then from the state, one can then also derive um, together with the input and, and output O, and then the output O can be compared to some observation here and uh, connected with the loss function and how these states change and how the output is derived from the states depends on these weights here, typically for neural networks. I think you have heard that quite often in the last seminars and these weights are basically then, uh, then optimized. And actually I, I was uh, wondering uh, back in, yeah, back in 2016 or 17 when I had a sabbatical in Berkeley actually, so how, how good uh, can that actually uh, be? And here I basically just, um, tried to um, model the greenness of the vegetation. So that is um, observed from, from remote sending. It depends on how many leaves there are and how, how green they are. It um, can be also calculated as a fraction of photosynthetically active radiation here over, over Africa. And I basically, there was a very clever uh, guy, there's a guy from my group, Martin Jung, who also did these other upscalings and he, use the random forest with predicted uh, with standard metallurgical predictors plus some hand designed features like lag and cumulative water variables so very very tuned uh, features and predictors um, that you also even extract from a feature uh, selection algorithm and i contrasted that basically with a recurrent new network where i just used the standard metallurgical drivers and didn't think about what kind of features i could generate and i just trained it on four percent of the pixels and we end up here with this 
variation and uh, it's probably hard to see a difference between the random forest and the RNN. We see a little bit more small scale variability in the observations. But if you look uh, at the result, a little bit average over, over certain ecos um, um, ecosystems or biomes, uh, pretty strong actually um, uh, predictive uh, ability and, and actually better than even than the random forest with all this um, with hand design. But still, no, uh, no physical knowledge. And that, that's where uh, Basi Kraft came into play. We were actually wanted to understand actually where do memory effects play an important uh, role. And here's just, this is just one example how one can interrogate uh, such a, a machine learning approach. And uh, one, so the idea here basically is, okay, let's give uh, first the, uh, the machine learning approach to recurrent neural network access to the real time series, basically uh, order the time as it is, and then uh, give it an, in another experiment, don't give it access to the temporal order, so shuffle the data completely. Um, so it's basically then just like a regression approach. It cannot learn any dynamic effect, any memory. Or one can say, well, let it access at least the last time step or the last two time steps, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 uh, time steps to see actually how long uh, memory plays an important role. Um, and, uh, according to the uh, to this metric here, which is just the error with, with permutation minus the error without permutation, and the error is measured as root mean squared error here. And then we can basically map that uh, and see where memory effects on vegetation and anomalies play an important role or dynamic effects. Um, and what we see actually is a particular importance in the semi arid. Area, uh, regions which alludes to a strong uh, memory effect via, via soil moisture. But what we also see um, is actually interesting. The memory effects play a different role for the mean season of the cycle and for the uh, anomaly. <clears throat> so the blue line is here the, uh, the memory effect uh, for the anomaly. So basically um, what we see here basically um, uh, the, the relative improvement, the more memory, uh, the more time step we basically take uh, into account. And these are, um, I think, eight daily, and it's um, 15 daily time steps. Um, yeah, and, and, and what we see here in the, in the water driven systems, transitional water driven systems, actually, this the memory effects are particularly important for the anomalies, while in a transitional energy driven system that is more like where we are living in the mid, mid latitudes actually the anomalies uh, the memory effect plays an important role here for the red for the mean seasonal cycle and the interpretation again is on the left hand side this is probably water anomaly water related precipitation effects uh, soil moisture effect and on the right hand side it's probably more about temperature effects uh, that have an, a strong effect on the on the seasonal cycle of spring for the vegetation um, but Still, to do is, of course, to attribute that really to the specific drivers and to test these hypotheses that I just uh, just mentioned. Um, yeah, so this were, were some ways of well, probably would call them explainable AI or this direction, trying to understand what the system is doing and uh, interrogate um, the machine learning uh, model. Um, but then, um, this is also from the paper. Um, we actually thought, okay, but there must be also a stronger link with process space and, and, and physical modeling. And some of those um, are pretty clear. And there are also uh, many examples. Uh, I think I speed up a bit. Model emulation is an example. You can drive a model with machine learning output to isolate a sub model. The whole thing of residual analysis that is not just plotting a scatter plot and calculating an RSME, but doing pattern recognition on on this is has also quite a long uh, tradition so these are these three four and five but actually the the challenging ones um is are, are likely and where really the link between machine learning and process modeling is really intimate is this what we call hybrid modeling and and then model um, parameterization so for the hybrid model we basically say well we have sub model um that Gives them output and that gives input to, to another sub model. And maybe this sub model one we don't actually know very well, but we have a lot of data. We don't know the theory very well, but we have a lot of data. 
And so the idea is within the hybrid model to replace a submodel with a machine learning approach and then feed it into the uh, into the next sub model and then of course there can be also a, a feedback and for model parameterization it's a question if that's really different or not my, my interpretation is always that parameterization is more static um, and so one would have a meta model for parameterization on land for example we have a model to parameterize vegetation types that are, are based on ad hoc plant functional types Evergreen broadleaf, evergreen needle leaf. Uh, that is kind of a human based parameterization uh, model. And maybe we can find this data actually a better one uh, using machine learning. That would be just one example. <laughs> in the atmosphere realm, uh, and in, um, this plays a very important role. There are very, very uh, good, good examples also um, to parameterize actually the uh, strong heterogeneity um, within a large, big uh, grid box. One can use High resolution models for that. It's not my area of expertise. Many of you uh, work much more with that. And so I will just want just to show this to show that this is um, in the climate modeling, this plays a really important role. Um, so, but I want to go more again back to the um, land processes. And there, basically, um, again, the idea is, and that's here on, on the right hand side, um, that we have again a process that is well known like physical diffusion and energy balance of a leaf um which will make a very uh, make possible uh, diffusion of water uh, vapor from the leaf to the, and to the atmosphere that which we call transpiration <clears throat> but this uh, diffusion constant uh, is um is controlled by this little holes in the leaf the so-called so stomata and and they are basically behaving in a physiological way which is not very well understood there are a lot of semi empirical equations some theory also, but really not a theory like, like Neville Stokes <clears throat> also. And so the idea is we have a lot of data, particularly from the flux sites, as I showed you. Um, so the idea is basically to model um, those, uh, the sequence of stomach aperture with a neural network approach, recurrent neural networks, for example, and then have that as an, uh, the output of this is a diffusion coefficient, so physically interpretable variable. Uh, and that's then fed into this physical model to give them uh, transpiration and photosynthesis. Um, this is a kind of the abstract um, idea. We actually have a uh, we have an example actually from from the sorry for changing here, but for for respiration that is I think pretty uh, pretty nice. Uh, that we have a similar situation. Respiration certainly de depends on temperature and we know enzyme kinetics and so on. But then respiration, so the decomposition of organic matter and uh, and the release of CO2 into the atmosphere uh, also depends on all kinds of biological activities, uh, what we call the base activity, and that depends on soil moisture, depends on how active the roots are, <laughs> depends on the animals uh, that are digging in the soil, and so on and so forth. So much harder to model, uh, possible to model with purely physical uh, uh, equations. So the idea here, um, yeah, okay. And people have been actually trying, okay, one, one step back, uh, have been trying to, to model that actually with a very simple uh, equations or bivariate relationships, and I would actually say that is bad data science <clears throat> because they then end up okay, they just put one against the other and say, Oh, here on that side, there's a huge temperature sensitivity, high Q10. That means global warming would play an important uh, role for, for, for the carbon cycle, but another size is much lower. But the reason is that this RB parameter varies, um, so this is just an apparent temperature sensitivity, not, not the real one. Here we have summer active systems where the roots are active in summer when it's warm. In the red part, we it's a Mediterranean system, it's dry in summer, and that's why the ecosystem respiration is low. So we have confounding factor, confounding factors confounding the, the real temperature dependency. Um, we've been looking at that with a, again with hand design features doing analysis in the in the frequency domain, say that the Q10 can be determined from short-term signals, um, and then these base respiration is more seasonally varying. Uh, and, but, but here we say, okay, why don't we model that with this hybrid approach? We have this center equation, which is a physical equation, still more of a toy model. And then the, the base respiration depends on a neural network, a recurrent neural network. Um, so it's modeled in a data-driven way and we estimate the Q10 and the, uh, the neural network parameters at the same time. Uh, what we get actually, uh, we get very similar courses for this base 
a respiration, which is very nice, but we get, get additional variability using this hybrid machine learning approach. And if you zoom into those, actually we see that we get actually a variation at the diurnal scale. So we have inference of the space respiration at a different time scale. This is now more a hypothesis. We don't know if it's true or if it's correcting for some other biases, but we have some uh, reason to believe that there is some truth to it. And the main point is that with this hybrid modeling, we not only get better predictions, but also uh, can infer these latent variables and, um, and, and states um, to learn something about the system. I wanted to show something about a global hydrological model. I think I have to speed that up. I'm, I'm really sorry, but if you have questions about that, we can have that in the Q&A. Uh, that's also very, uh, very nice because we can also infer some latent uh, variables like soil moisture there. And I wrap up here. I just want to make the point in general um, that I think it's really important that why your seminar is also so important that we have really to embrace both hypothesis driven and data driven science. The classical way is hypothesis, theory, model, then we have predicted patterns. These are then observations are designed to confront these patterns, uh, optimal experimental design to work here, uh, and that the models can be improved. But we can also start just from the other way, starting with observations, derive observationally driven products, some of them I have showed, try to understand or get observed patterns that differentiate from the noise, generate hypotheses that might, exp might explain these patterns, and then we basically close the loop because we have new hypotheses. And the re really interesting uh, things actually comes when we compare these observed patterns to predicted patterns. And only if um, the observed patterns are not seen by uh, state-of-the-art models, then we can actually talk about an interesting puzzle. Because often in the, on the empirical sides, People see often something and say, oh, that's really surprising, but they didn't test that actually with a process-based model. The process-based model could actually have this counterintuitive behavior itself through the emergent behavior um, in, in the model. So I think this interplay is really important between this data-driven and hypothesis um, science. <clears throat> and uh, maybe in, in, in the last, I just want to um, actually advertise and ask for interactions between the US uh, communities and the European uh, communities. So there is this European lab for learning and intelligent system where Gustav comes wild and I have actually a, a program or need a program, machine learning for us and climate sciences. And uh, we also have um, webinars. Unfortunately, they are still at lunchtime, European time at this point. So we might want to change it, but just contact me via the, this email address or via, via Twitter also. Um, to get in contact and to make these important things. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Marcus. So we'll take the next 15 minutes for a Q&A for him. So if you have any questions, use the raise your hand button or you can type it into the chat box. All right, a question from Mike Pritchard. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Hey, thanks. Um, yeah, lots of food for thought there. Um, I was wondering if you could uh, elaborate a little bit on the method of um, of asking questions like where are the sources of memory in an RNN? And I'll admit that I have no experience in the convection parameterization world of looking non-locally in time, but I thought about it. And um, yeah, you showed a really interesting graph where the anomaly versus climatological sources of memory were, were separable um, <clears throat> in, in transitional water versus energy regimes. I'm just wondering how, yeah, what the process is and how it feels compared to uh, methods we might be more familiar with, um, like uh, saliency maps or um, et cetera. Yeah, so basically, I mean, this is really uh, this is just just a perm permutation uh, test, if you want, uh, if you want. Um, and the and the difference basically just comes, uh, so there has been not a, how to say, um, there has not been a specific um, I have to say, as a specific um, analysis on, on different timescales, but it's rather that the the evaluation metric, so the the evaluation metric, or the, the model has been run on the on the full time series uh, and not on, on on mean season cycle and anomalies, but on the full time series. But then in the evaluation of the uh, of the model, either with permuted data or with non permuted data, the evaluation has been just or the metric. For evaluation has been either calculated just on the mean season cycle or on the deviations from the mean season cycle. So that's basically the 
MSC, the mean season cycle, and the anomalies are the deviations from the mean season cycle, and the, and the green one uh, is, <clears throat> is is basically the, the the raw the raw time series. Um, so there's uh, I don't know. There's no no specific uh, method here, but and it just comes out of the results that obviously in the water driven systems um, memory effects are if, or, or including memory effects improve the prediction of anomalies more strongly or at least as strongly as for as the in the cycle while in transitional energy driven systems including memory effects have a much stronger effect on the meeting the cycle prediction than than on the anomalies are not that important for the anomalies. Thank you. It sounds directly analogous to perturbation. Thank you. Yeah, 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 that's yeah. true. I was overthinking it. We have a question in the chat box by Val Bennington. Uh, thank you for your talk. How do you estimate uncertainty in your global estimates of land carbon fluxes when reconstructing from sparse flux net observations and satellite observations? Yeah, <laughs> that's a very... <laughs> Very good question. I can talk, talk uh, for long about it, and there are, there are several aspects of, of the uh, of the uh, of the uncertainty. So, so one one can say basically is a, a methodological uh, uncertainty. The different machine learning methods regularize in different ways, extrapolate in different ways. So, there's of course this uncertainty, which one can take into account. So, what we do is Kind of an ensemble of various uh, machine learning approaches. That's one source of information, uh, one source of variability. Then, of course, uh, or source of uncertainty. Another source of uncertainty is, of course, the underlying data, both the flux data. We also have different estimates, so we also use an ensemble of different a data ensemble, if you want, of different estimates for photosynthesis and respiration, for example. Um, then, for the prediction, uh, the, uh, there are uncertainties in the predictors. On the on the global scale, that is uh, uncertainties in, in the reanalysis, for example. So here we can also use just different products. Again, small ensemble, if you want, uh, uh, approach with two or three different ones, and then one can basically combine all of them to get an ensemble. I think we have, for example, for the water fluxes. Uh, no, actually, for both, we have kind of five hundred estimates. No. Uh, uh, and so, the, the, and from that, one can get a nominal uncertainty that includes those uncertainties that I just mentioned. But there is one uncertainty that we don't have a very good hold on, and you are probably alluding to that. <clears throat> it is basically the extrapolation uh, uncertainty, and um, one cannot say that well, it's just a different machine learning methods. The difference between them probably scales a bit with the extrapolation degree, but probably not fully. And yeah, then we have the tropics. Uh, where we have really few stations and one can actually not do too much uh, about it or it's very hard even to estimate the uncertainties. Um, and of course, there's been an early critique early on um, that, yeah, how can you estimate something in the tropics when there are only five stations or so? And of course, it relies on some hypothesis. If you want, at the end, um, uh, what biologists, what bi biologists would probably call biological convergence, to some extent. The interesting thing is, and I showed that for the for our uh, for our um, beach forest, for example, is that um, there's always once in a while, actually, in other systems, also Florida, for example, but also even even in, in southern Europe. So there are sometimes really these tropical conditions with temperatures. 25 degrees of, uh, for the day and also during the night, high humidity and so on. So one could argue, well, the systems, uh, the, the, the machine learning system has actually seen some of those conditions also at other sites. Of course, this is kind of space for time and, uh, and, and this can be also, uh, can be also an error. Um, what gave us actually quite some confidence, uh, yeah, and I did, didn't show that because I wanted to go more into this hybrid modeling, but is, um, was already in the paper from Martin Jung in 2010, where we could check our fluxes with a totally independent source of information, and this was a catchment water balance. 
um, where we basically we have an estimate of evapotranspiration from our from our bottom up fluxes from from the eddy covariance. Um, and then one can also construct an estimate of evapotranspiration from the catchment water balance if we have the runoff or the stream flow. We know the precipitation uh, and assume no change in storage over, over long, long periods. We uh, then get an estimate of evapotranspiration and these two estimates actually corresponded, um, corresponded um, quite well. So that gave definitely some confidence. Or we, um, in a recent paper, 2020, we, we compared um, our estimates with Atmospheric based uh, inversions of the of carbon fluxes um, uh, from Transcom, you may have heard about it. And there we also get um, uh, good results actually for, uh, in particular for the seasonal cycle. And what we actually believe is that we actually do get a very good um, estimate of, of the seasonal dynamics some information, but with a wrong variance on the interannual variability between year variability um, and also spatial variability of the gross flux. This is uh, pretty well captured, but what is pretty bad, um, and you can again compare that to the other side, is actually the mean carbon balance, so the net ecosystem exchange where our product is has too much source and this, uh, too much sink, that too much sink is likely in the tropics and probably has to do with a representation that is not uh, good enough, but also possibly with measurement uh, errors um, that not go into some detail, but where we have the turbulent fluxes during the night in the tropics are, are not very uh, good. And despite all quality control, probably one is still underestimating uh, some of the nighttime fluxes or the respiration. And that would mean we miss some of the losses of carbon. Okay, that was a long answer. <laughs> um, yeah, but you're right. So uncertainties are important, and some of them we capture. Others, it's hard to capture, um, but it's an important thing. A question from Alea Kashik. Thanks for the great talk. Can you recommend where EC folks not exposed to much machine learning can start learning more? I work with land surface models, and I see opportunities for machine learning to help refine parameters, but not sure how to go about figuring out the details. Um, EC, what is EC? Leah, can you clarify? Sorry, that's uh, sorry, um, early career folks, but I ah. suppose eddy covariance will fall into that too. Sorry about that. No, no, okay, uh, that would be ECR would have rang the bell, but yeah, EC, okay. Um, uh, okay, I don't know what you are specifically referring to. Well, I guess in general, like for somebody who's interested in learning more about how to incorporate machine learning into their own work, do you recommend like taking a college class or are there workshop materials out there? Um, anything like that? Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, uh, in, in general, I think it is, it is indeed, uh, I think in the, in the last years, it has actually improved a lot. Um, and there are. <clears throat> Uh, seminars and uh, it starts to get into into the curricula um, and there are also resources like if you think about deep learning okay i mean i didn't know anything about deep learning until 2016 i think and i did sabbatical so i basically read the good fellow book that was already online at that time so it's good fellow deep learning i think that's an excellent book uh, for an introduction um, including not too deep and too theoretical mathematical concepts, but some. Um, yeah, good. I mean, we, we have actually, uh, yeah, I mean, because we have also a couple of people that start with that in our department, we actually do have a, a lot of things uh, going on exactly for that reason, like pizza lunch meetings with uh, some, some basics on, uh, on machine learning. Um, but uh, but then, for example, there are also a lot of links are posted. Uh, so I think there are a lot of resources actually now coming up uh, that are pretty pretty good. Um, so I think it's not so much a limiting factor in IT. Yeah, and I see in the comment too from Katie Dagon in Car Summer School last year on AI for and on AI for Earth System uh, Science. So all those slides and recordings are available online. 
Yeah, that's exactly. So and yeah, so there there is really a lot of thought going on. Uh, we have three minutes left. Do we have any final questions for Marcus? Uh, see, Mike Pritchard. Go ahead. All right. As long as there's dead air, could you go back to your lovely flowchart that showed data science coexisting with traditional hypothesis-driven science and uh, playing the role yeah. as the hypothesis generator? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I love that vision, but yeah. Um, what are the most provocative hypotheses that have been generated um, by by these tools that weren't already there? You know, in the cloud community, I realized I don't have a striking example uh, yet. Maybe there's a couple where maybe causal inference said there's a convoluted pathway that a teleconnection works and you can put numbers on how much one pathway versus the other, but I think things must be changing quickly. I'm just curious in your community if there are any that have stuck with you or, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's that's um, that's actually a good point. I think it's actually not so so easy really to find them. I mean, I believe the work. I, I remember now some, some work of, of ourselves, um, especially the work on on extreme events. How important they are for ecosystems and for the climate cycle. I think this has been pretty much observational driven. I mean, um, so for actually. It was a wake up call for uh, myself and actually for the European community where we had this observation network in place in two, for the 2003 heat wave, <clears throat> where Philip Sias and myself and others look, looked at the effects. And then we looked at that more globally and found that, that these extreme events actually do play an important role. They are, have also a scale according to power law. And that I, I think, apart from other, other work, has also stimulated. Thinking about how to bring that into uh, into models and 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 and, and other well, how to generate hypotheses. And another thing is, I think exactly these memory effects that are that we see not only on the seasonal timescale, which are maybe still uh, well interpretable, but also longer timescales. Again, observational uh, driven work from. Alan and, and others, so forest mortality, something that one just sees and then wonders what are the mechanisms that stimulated a lot of research, what causes the mortality of trees. Uh, there are two hypotheses. One is really that they desiccate, um, is the embolism so that the, the water string and the, the trees um, tears apart. The other hypothesis is, is that they close their stomata and, uh, and, and die of hunger. So I think that would be another example, but it, it is true that that often it's still also good to to think this both uh, together and think about how certain apparent patterns that one finds can actually be reconciled with with the hypothesis uh, that one already has. Um, so this example of this temperature sensitivity is an example where people have published a lot of times Q tens of ten. So very strong temperature sensitivities, ignoring this confounding effect. And so we then we look, okay, let's look at that with a more data-driven approach, not just plotting one against the other, but with a little bit more thinking and integrating how systems work with frequency analysis. And that we found basically that the Q10 usually is below 10 or always is below, uh, below two. So that's a, a more of an example where the surprise is a parent surprise of, of a Q10 of 10 is actually just caused by confounding factors and where one should actually bring together modeling concept and, and the observed patterns immediately instead of making the claim that one has a surprise. Thank you. All right, I think that'll wrap up for today's uh, webinar. So thank you again so much, Marcus, for your talk. Thank you for the discussion. <clears throat> So our next webinar is scheduled for April 5th. Um, that is featuring Maria Molina from NCAR. I'll send out those announcements and then the recording from uh, today's talk from Marcus will be available later this week. So thank you again, everyone for participating. Have a great night.